This presentation is brought to you by the friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Is it possible that we could have all the trappings of religion? Our lives could be festooned with all the religious paraphernalia, but the heart is not born again and we're lost. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. I remember hearing about a young man working his way through school in, uh, at a Taco Bell, working the night shift, Nicholas Zahn. Very busy one evening trying to manage the desk in the drive through window. And a woman uh, named Devorna Andrews let out a shriek. She had been standing in the line within the Taco Bell. He turned and looked and could see quickly that she was great with child. And as you might have guessed, she went into labor. He had to make some very important decisions right at that moment. He was there kind of managing the little Taco Bell and uh, called, took off his headset, called 911, ran around, tried to make her comfortable. And before he knew what was happening, he was catching a baby that, in his words, sort of just popped out in his hands <laughs> before the rescue vehicles could get there. Now, you might be thinking, if you own that Taco Bell, I did not hire that man to deliver babies. We had a lot of people waiting in line for their burritos and their tacos. A lot of people were lined up at the drive through window, and here he is delivering babies. He needs to get his priorities straight. Now, I don't think most of you were thinking that way. Most of you were probably thinking, well, Delivering a baby was the priority at the time. More important than delivering beans, right? Human beans are more important than pinot beans. Do we all agree with that? <laughs> now, I say that because uh, sometimes we can come to church and we can get so involved in the routine and the busyness of what we're doing that we forget the priorities. The priority of everything we do as Christians is summed up in the new birth. There must be new creations. We must be born again. And I've titled the message today, well for the next two weeks it's going to be on Nicodemus. Today is part one. Nicodemus, part one, born again. But I want you to turn with me to Gospel of John chapter 3. And in a special sense we'll be considering verses 1 through 8 Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now we're going to take that verse apart and we're going to learn about Nicodemus. You might be wondering, Nicodemus is mentioned five times in the Bible, only in the Gospel of St. John. And he plays a, pomin a prominent role uh, there at the beginning of Christ's ministry. Uh, sort of in the midst of Christ's ministry and then ultimately at the end of Jesus' ministry. Why is Nicodemus not mentioned by Matthew, Mark, or Luke? I think part of the key is that he is a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. They were well acquainted with the Word, but they believed that they were saved by virtue of keeping the law. They did not understand grace. And uh, if you were a Pharisee, and if you were not only a Pharisee, but if you were part of the Sanhedrin, I'll get to that in just a moment, and you converted to Christianity, well, the other Pharisees and Sadducees would see that as a betrayal, and it would be something like if you lived in Pakistan today, and you were a Pakistani um, Islamic teacher, and you converted to Christianity, do you realize that the penalty is death? Are you aware of that? That's right. And there are some 
Pakistanis who have converted to Christianity that have been executed and they're supported by the government in that when they are executed. If you were a Pharisee and part of the Sanhedrin and you converted to Judaism, did they try to kill Paul for doing it? So one theory is that Nicodemus, who we all know became a follower of Christ, and his high station, when he converted, he had a price on his head. The writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he may have still been alive during their time. John wrote his gospel last. Nicodemus had probably died at that point, and it was safe to talk about him by name. There was no harm done at that point. But he was very prominent. The early church knew he, who he was. He sort of needed to live a little bit incognito because he may have had a price on his head because of what was seen as a betrayal by the religious leaders at the time. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a very religious man. Went to church, fasted, paid tithe. Keep in mind that um, the Pharisees were also missionaries. You remember in Matthew where Jesus denounces the Pharisees and he issues these scathing rebukes. He says, you cross land and sea for one convert. So they believed in missionary work. They were very religious. But Nicodemus comes to Jesus because he knows something is missing. Not only does it say he's a Pharisee, it tells us that his name is Nicodemus. The word Nicodemus means victory of the people. Now I think that's significant because Nicodemus sort of represents all of us who need to come to Jesus. And uh, he's searching for truth. And he finds it in Christ. Furthermore, it tells us that he was a ruler of the people. I'm still in verse 1. A ruler of the Jews. The rulers of the Jews were part of the Sanhedrin. Now there may have only been about eight or 10,000 official members of the Pharisees during the time of Christ. There are a number of Pharisees in training. But among the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders there, 70 were chosen to represent the people. It was the supreme court of the Jewish nation. They were called the Sanhedrin. They were the rulers of the people. We know that Nicodemus sat with this group because it mentions him speaking out during one of the Sanhedrin meetings in defense of Jesus. And we'll talk about that again later as well. So here you've got this man who has great possessions, great position. He is extremely religious. And by the way, the word Pharisee comes from the Jewish word farash. And it means to set apart. They were the separated ones. But he had heard Jesus teaching. And he knew that something was missing. There was a purity. There was a simplicity. There was a grace about what Jesus said that was so different from the pharisaical teachings of the day. He knew that Jesus supported Moses and the law and the prophets, and yet it was mingled with grace, and the Pharisees were missing that. He saw the boldness. He saw the miracles and the works of Christ. And it says that he came to Jesus at night during the darkest time. Maybe he didn't want the scrutiny. There tells us that there's this sincerity. He does come to Jesus, but he comes when it's dark. He's timid about it. And he feels a conflict between this yearning, this sincerity, and this timidity about having others see. Now, I thought it was interesting that in all of the Gospel of John, and you might jot these scriptures down because they're going to come up again, where it talks about Nicodemus. He's only mentioned five times. It says, verse uh, 2, chapter 3, verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night. You go to chapter 7 when it talks about Nicodemus. It says, he that came to Jesus by night. Then you go to chapter 19, verse 39, and John is again talking about Nicodemus which first came to Jesus by night. Five times, or three times there it says, he came to Jesus by night. You know, we must assume that uh, when they came to arrest Jesus, when did they come? Why did they come at night? They didn't want the multitudes to see what they were doing. Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus at night, was trying to hide from other prying eyes 
Yeah, they didn't have the street lights like we have today. Well, all they had was these little candle lights, uh, handheld lamps. They're not very bright. You've got to get really close to a person to make out who they are with those primitive lights. Not much better than a kerosene lamp. And he came to Jesus. We also believe because the Apostle John writes of Nicodemus and the Apostle John during the trial of Christ knew people in the priesthood that John may have even arranged the meeting. They may have had family members that were in the priesthood. John and James and, and Nicodemus through his uh, secretary, his administrative secretary, you know, he's a very wealthy man, he's got an entourage, he makes contact and says, you know, I would really appreciate a private audience with the teacher. And John works it out and Jesus says, I'll be happy to talk to him. And so they come at some point, probably not far from Jerusalem, and he has this visit with Jesus. Doesn't want others to see doesn't want to create a spectacle, does not want it to be in the tabloids of Jerusalem the next day that one of the prominent wealthy Pharisees, Sanhedrin member, is interviewing with Jesus. Might send the wrong signal. So maybe he's a little frightened. But he knows that Jesus has the truth. So he comes at night. You know, I thought it was also interesting that when you read in, in the Gospel of John, he comes to Christ and he makes this opening introduction and he says in verse 2, Rabbi, we know. Who is the we? Did he have a mouse in his pocket? <laughs> Were there other members of the Sanhedrin that believed that Jesus might be the one? Well, you would think of all these religious leaders out of 70 of them, there must have been more than just one that had it right. I mean, out of the 12 spies, there were at least two that were faithful. So out of the 70, there could have been a handful, five or six, that believed. And if you read later, even some of the priests in Acts chapter 5 believed on Jesus. So Nicodemus is not just representing himself. He said, we, we know that you are a teacher come from God and that no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Part of the reason that they believe in Christ, he saw the works of Jesus. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No. He saw the wonderful things that Christ was doing. And he believed that this, this man must be from God. Can the devil do miracles? Does that mean you're never supposed to notice the wonderful works? Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Works are one of the signs of the power of God. Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark, these works will follow them that believe. These miracles, these signs will follow. Nicodemus was probably in the background observing some of the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, of Jesus. Maybe firsthand he beheld some of these things. Keep in mind in the Gospel of John chapter 9, there is a man who is born blind from birth. He's brought into the Sanhedrin. And in front of the whole Sanhedrin, he says, I was born blind, and I don't know who it was, but all I know is I was blind, and now I see. They heard, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, they heard about the miracles of Jesus. They had messengers that were coming back reporting to them. So he knew about what Christ was doing. It was turning their religious world upside down. He knew. He said, we, we know you've come from God. No one can do these things. And he begins with, you know, giving respect to Jesus. Jesus is a carpenter. He's poor. His um, apostles are largely poor. And yet he still shows respect to Christ and maybe he's trying to, you know, butter him up with a lot of the platitudes and the flowery language that uh, they've got. Jesus, when he begins to respond, he cuts through all of that and he goes right to the heart of what Nicodemus needs to hear. And what does Jesus say to him? You need to be born again. John 3.3 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, now that's the strongest definite language, King James, verily, verily, I'm telling you for a fact, don't miss this, get this straight. This is the truth, what I'm about to say. That's what he's saying when he says, verily, verily. I am telling you, you can count on this, take it to the bank. And so he's using very strong terms when he's speaking to Nicodemus. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that really exploded his world. 
Because every Pharisee was waiting for the kingdom of God, which they thought was going to be on earth. And they thought when the kingdom of God did come, that the first ones that would lead out in that new kingdom would be the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees prided themselves on being guardians on the law of Moses, the constitution of the kingdom, if you will. And to say that to somebody who is in the most religious group in the kingdom, who is sitting on the supreme court of that religious group, and to tell them, uh, looking for the kingdom of God and saying, you don't have a ho hope unless you are born again. Now you know why I thought this message was important? Sometimes you can go to church for years and not be born again. But according to Christ, you might have power, intellectual skill, leadership, power, great possessions, very religious, dedicated, devoted, reads his Bible, knows his Bible, lost unless you're born again. Is it possible that we could have all the trappings of religion? Our lives could be festooned with all the religious paraphernalia, but the heart is not born again and we're lost. The new birth is crucial for salvation. If you've got everything and you don't have the new birth, you have nothing. By the way, this wasn't a totally new concept even though Nicodemus seemed to balk at what Jesus was saying, it wasn't a totally foreign concept. Ezekiel 18 verse 30 through 32, Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Well, that's what Christ was talking about. And the new birth is a new heart and a new spirit. Do you agree with that? Is the new birth something different from the new heart? No, it's the same thing. Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Here, even in the Old Testament, without the new heart, without the new spirit, without the new birth, you can't see the kingdom of God. I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. So, new birth represents a turning. It's a repentance. And so, when we talk about the new birth, it's not an appendage that the Lord sows into our heart. It is a heart transplant is what it is. He makes us new creatures. Have you seen somebody experience a new birth? And you say, boy, they're just, they're not the same person. They're all new. One example of that would be 1 Samuel 10, verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord, God said, I'm going to read verses 6 and verses 9. This is 1 Samuel 10. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, God said, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. So it was that when he had turned back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart and all these signs came to pass that day. Saul, who was very timid when they first chose him to be king, he was hiding in the baggage, hiding among the, the baggage and the stuff. You remember that? He was so timid. God gave him a heart of courage and he became a great king. But ultimately, he surrendered to pride and selfishness and he lost the Holy Spirit. And what was once the new heart turned into a, an old heart. That's why Paul said, I die daily. When you're born again, you got this new life within and you've got to crucify the old man. Otherwise, he's going to try and resurrect. God is calling us to be new creations. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so what does a new birth mean? That we are born in Christ. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You and I become new creatures when we're born again. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create. You notice it doesn't say repair. Create in me a clean heart. The only way that you can get a new heart is as a creative act of God. It is the Word of God that creates a new heart within us. It's a miracle. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16, Moses said, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. They were so preoccupied with the external part of the religion, Moses told them even back there in the Old Testament that these rites really pointed to a change in the heart. And then Paul makes that real clear when he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. And by the way, Nicodemus knew these verses, didn't he? In the Old Testament. 
For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation is what God wants. A new heart. Are you born again? Why is it necessary to be born again? Why born again? Because the old man with the old nature cannot be changed. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Jeremiah, the human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's why we need to be born again. Because the old heart is unconverted. It's unregenerate. And it cannot, Jesus said, the way you are now, Nicodemus, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's not enough to be a Pharisee. It's not enough to be part of the Sanhedrin. It's not enough to be a child of Abraham. You may have been born in the church. You may have position in the church. You may have evidence of prosperity and God's blessings. You've got all of that. But if you don't have a new heart, you can't be saved. I want to make sure we have our priority straight this year. We must be born again. Now is the real important part of the issue. Born again, how? How are we born again? Verse 4, Nicodemus says to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How? How does it happen? It's a miracle of the Spirit of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is very important. 1 Peter 1, verse 23. Having been born again, Peter's talking about being born again. It's not John. This is Peter. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, not being born of human seed, not human genes, but the incorruptible genes of God through the what? Through the Word. Being born again through the Word. We're not that far into the new year. Do you read your Bible every day? Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. How are you born again? Born again through the Word. Well, Christ is the Word. You're born again through Christ. But how does Christ change our hearts? Through the Word. That's our only hope of becoming like Christ. We're changed by beholding through the Word. There's something miraculous about the Word. It causes creation. How did Jesus create the world? He spoke and it happened. And as you read the Word, you get this new heart. And as you read the Word, you've got to allow the Word to do its thing. That's part of the how still. Philippians 2 verse 5, I'm telling you how to be born again. Let this mind, by the way, the Bible says, as you think in your heart. So when it says let this mind, it means let this heart. Let this mind, let this heart to be in you which was in Christ Jesus. You notice it says let it. You know why Paul says let it? Because it's possible sometimes that we won't let it happen. We resist it. As we're reading the Word and you, the Holy Spirit is working on us and we feel that sense of conviction, we push away. We close our hearts. And he says, open your heart. Let the Word have its work in your heart. We're born again through the Word and let it happen. John chapter 3 verse 5 and Jesus answered, and He says it again, emphatically, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The Gospel of John begins with John the Baptist baptizing. And He says, except you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Water birth is your choice to surrender your life. The Spirit is God's choice. The world was baptized in water in the days of Noah and it was going to be baptized, it's going to be baptized in fire when Christ comes again. Our world is going to be born of the water, born of the fire of the Spirit and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. We need both. Children of Israel went down through the Red Sea, water baptism, born of the water, baptized in the water and then the pillar of cloud, the fire, baptized in the Spirit, the fire both baptisms. It's not talking about being born of a woman. But we need both. And if you've been baptized in the water but you've not been baptized in the Spirit, then Jesus is saying the same thing to you that He said to Nicodemus. Don't 
missed the most important part. You must be born again. I think it's something to pray for, to pursue. You know what I like about this story? Nicodemus, as you read his life, he came to Jesus. He, he defended Jesus and his teachings, and at the end of his life, when Christ was on the cross, Nicodemus was there, wasn't he? Amen. I think Nicodemus did get the new heart that he was born again. It says he came to Jesus. He came at night, but he did come. And if we would be born again, we need to come to Christ. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Some of the most beautiful songs and music have come from people who are writing from a broken heart. Somebody once said, the richest fragrance comes from the crushed flower. You're never too little for God to use, but you could be too much for God to use. Suicide is the result of someone who's lost hope, they've lost faith, and then the last act is murder of themselves. Every day, people spend about 7 hours and 45 minutes sleeping, 17 seconds brushing their teeth, 1 hour and 15 minutes eating, 4 hours and 50 minutes watching TV, and 33 minutes on the phone. With only 24 hours in the day, where does God fit in? Moving Mountains, a new daily devotional. It's about understanding God and building your faith. With 366 short stories to inspire and encourage, your day will never be the same. AFBookstore.com, life-changing Christian resources. Friends, do you sometimes feel weighed down with regret for past decisions? Have you ever wished that you could rewind the tape of life? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take a bath and clean our memories away? Well, God has an institute, a wonderful ceremony known as baptism. Many people ignore this act as a mere formality, but from the beginning, God places a significant emphasis on this sacred service. It's interesting to note that the cross is mentioned 28 times in the Bible, while baptism is mentioned about 97 times. What is baptism really? Is there a right method or wrong regarding how to be baptized? To answer these questions, we prepared a beautifully illustrated study guide on the subject of baptism. It's called Power and Purity. This fascinating study resource will help you discover God's plan to wash away our sins and to provide a new beginning. Please call the toll-free number and ask for offer number 121. Or you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 121, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until next time, friends, remember the words in the Bible, Acts 2.48, those who gladly received His word were baptized. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.